Happy Monday. Happy Labor Day. Thanks for being with us on this holiday. We begin this morning with severe weather across the country. Out west, extreme heat and wildfires are impacting millions, while parts of Georgia and Indiana are dealing with severe flooding. NBC News correspondent George Solis joins us now from hard-hit Somerville, Georgia, with more. Hey, George, good morning. Hey, good morning, Savannah. Residents here catching a bit of a break as some of those high waters have started to recede. But make no mistake, the damage is done here. A lot of the residents this morning waking up to a boil water advisory. And unfortunately, the threat of rain continues. This morning, a Labor Day of extreme weather from coast to coast. Parts of Georgia remain underwater after torrential downpours this weekend turn roads into rivers. We have had some flooding uh, issues, but nothing uh, as uh, serious as this. The state's governor declaring a state of emergency after more than a foot of rain fell in some areas in just 12 hours. Never seen it this high. Floodwaters surrounding homes, submerging cars, and even inundating the local water plant in Somerville. Local officials now urging residents in the area to boil water and stay inside. It's going to be a, at least a day or two before we can assess the damages that have taken place uh, at our water plant. Flash flooding also overwhelming communities in southern Indiana. It is literally taking up our whole yard. Where at least one death likely connected to the storm has been reported. Oh no. Oh. In Texas, storms knocked out power to more than 100,000 people and forced a temporary ground stop at the Dallas Fort Worth Airport. Out west, 46 million people remain under heat alerts through Wednesday. It's been awful hot. In Death Valley, temperatures topped 120 degrees for six consecutive days. The extreme temperatures in the region being prolonged by a heat dome, a high pressure system pushing warm air towards the ground, effectively trapping it and creating even more heat. A challenge for firefighters on the front line of wildfires in Northern California that have burned dozens of homes and claimed at least two lives. That happened that fast. Robert and Barbara Thomas's house burned along with their granddaughter's home down the block. There's a lot of hurting in this community now. Mother Nature's wrath testing an already weary nation as weather extremes are expected to continue in the coming days. Savannah, back here in Somerville, officials very grateful that the drainage system was able to get rid of all of that water, given how quickly it rose this morning. The cleanup and the assessments of damage will begin. Some local churches here will be giving out bottled water and cl clothes all day to those impacted by the flash flooding. Savannah. We're thinking of those that live there in George. Stay safe. Thank you so much. And now let's get a check on your morning news now weather, see what's going to unfold the rest of the day. And week meteorologist Michelle Grossman joins us. Hey, Michelle. Hey there, Savannah, and we are going to see more weather extremes today from the flooding in the east to the western excessive heat. Uh, we're looking at temperatures into the 90s, triple digits. But let's start with the flooding risk because it's a large area we're looking at from New England all the way through the mid-Atlantic, the Ohio, Tennessee valleys into the southeast where you see this green. That is a flood watch. So, so many of us under a flood watch on this Labor Day, 78 million people impacted. And we could see some flash flooding as well. The darker blue, that's the likeliest chance for seeing some flash flooding. We have a very tropical atmosphere, so any sort of storm showers could drop a lot of rain in a short amount of time. Now, it's beneficial rain, but when it comes this fast, that's where we get the problems. We could see two inches of rain per hour, and we could see the largest amount of rain, especially where you see those darker colors in portions of the Northeast into New England. So that's going to be a big story on this Labor Day. Another really big story, it's been the big story since last week, will continue to be the big story all week long. Relief really doesn't come until a week and 46 million people impacted by a heat alert. Where you see the pink, that is an excessive heat warning. And we're looking at records being broken once again, daily, monthly, all-time records. Temperatures into the triple digits. Sacramento today, 112, 102 in Salt Lake City. Tomorrow, same story, if not a little bit warmer. We're looking at 115 in Sacramento and 110 in Phoenix. And we're going to see numbers like this Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday before we have a little bit of relief by the weekend. Did want to get to the tropics, too. We're watching two systems, Hurricane Danielle, also, Tropical Storm Earl, that was a hurricane at one point. It will be a hurricane again. The good news, Savannah, is both of these systems are going to curve off to the right, and we're not going to be impacted in the U.S. mainland. Mm. Back to you. All right. Yes. Always nice when we hear from you, Michelle, yeah. that we've got some good news. Thanks so much, Michelle. Yeah. Happy Labor Day. Sure.
And now let's get to Labor Day travel, bouncing back to pre-pandemic levels and even more. But this morning, there are new troubles for America's airports as those weekend storms head east. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa has the latest. After an excruciating summer of cancellations and delays, this holiday weekend was actually going relatively smoothly, and then Mother Nature basically threw airlines a new curveball. This amid a holiday travel surge that's even putting pre-pandemic numbers to shame. It's summer travel's last gasp, and this morning, new troubles. I woke up in the morning with a text message saying my flight was canceled. Overnight, severe storms in Texas grounding flights with dozens canceled and hundreds delayed. This as millions of Americans head home today from a long holiday weekend. 82% of travelers hitting the roads as gas prices continue to drop nationwide. We enjoy the travel in our vehicle and it's actually still a lot less expensive than flying. The rest taking to the skies. The line was, it was long, but they were steady. Making it the busiest Labor Day weekend since before the pandemic. Air travel up 2% from 2019. And after a summer plagued by staffing shortages and record-setting cancellations, now the airlines are getting back on track. American, Delta, United, and Southwest all reducing routes to help prevent delays. They finally cut their schedule to a point that they can reasonably operate without the sorts of widespread cancellations that were commonplace this summer. The result, fewer disruptions and packed planes. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg recently demanding improvements and proposing changes to flight refund policies. Overall, it has not been acceptable. And the government also launching a new dashboard website to help passengers. It details what each airline will do if your travel plans are derailed. So again, we are seeing those weather related curveballs, but overall things have been getting better. We can harken back for comparison to Memorial Day weekend, the beginning of the summer. We actually over that weekend saw 2700 flight cancellations nationwide. Cut now to Labor Day weekend. This weekend so far we've seen about 550 close to 600. So it has dropped drastically. The FAA though does note that travel tends to kind of fall off a little bit heading into the end of the summer and early fall and then it picks back up again in November and December. So they do expect more capacity related challenges heading into the holidays. Back to you. All right, Maggie, thank you so much. Now, the arrival of Labor Day, the unofficial end of summer, also marks the kickoff of the fall campaign season and the final push before the midterms. NBC News senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell has more on the battle for control of Congress. Good day to you. There will be parades and cookouts, but this is a day of work, not a holiday for candidates around the country, hoping to connect with voters. And although their names will not appear on the ballot anywhere, the influence of President Biden and his predecessor, Donald Trump, is a factor to watch in these midterm races. This Labor Day kicks off a nine-week sprint to the decisive midterm elections, with candidates reaching out. We're going to win big in November, and we're going to do it because all of you. I'm going to come down and stand with the union way of life. Both parties battling for an advantage in a razor-thin environment. With control of the Senate and House at stake, the biggest voice in the Republican Party back on the campaign trail this weekend in Pennsylvania. His first public appearance since the FBI searched his home last month. The Mar-a-Lago raid was a desperate effort to distract from Joe Biden's record of misery. But the former president offered no explanation for why the FBI found 103 classified documents, 48 empty folders marked for highly classified secrets, and more than 11,000 government-owned documents and photographs. Although the search was court-authorized for the entire Trump residence and premises, he complained that family areas were touched. And even did a deep and ugly search of the room of my 16-year-old son, and the former president is selling a larger message. They're trying to silence me, and more importantly, they are trying to silence you. The Biden administration is defending the president, who says MAGA extremism is a threat. This MAGA Republican agenda that we saw incite violence on our nation's capital has no place in a democracy. 
Democrats say that recent surprise wins in some special elections show they have momentum toward November. While Republicans say they need to focus on issues like inflation and crime to win control of Congress. Today, President Biden will be out campaigning himself in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. All right, Kelly O'Donnell, thank you so much. And now let's get to some breaking news out of the UK this morning. Liz Truss is set to become the next British Prime Minister after she won the contest to succeed Boris Johnson as leader of the Conservative Party. The current Foreign Secretary was up against the former Finance Minister, Rishi Sunak, in a vote held only among party members. Here's Truss speaking moments ago after being declared the winner. It's an honor to be elected as leader of the Conservative and Unionist Party. I'd like to thank the 1922 Committee, the Party Chairman and the Conservative Party for organising one of the longest job interviews in history. We will deliver, we will deliver, and we will deliver. And we, and we, We will deliver a great victory for the Conservative Party in 2024. Thank you. We're joined now by Scott Lucas. He's a professor of international politics at the Clinton Institute, University College, Dublin. Thank you for being with us this morning. So tell us just a little bit first on this breaking news about who Liz Truss is. What do Americans here need to know and how she won this leadership contest in the end? Well, Liz Truss... Uh, is, is sort of a, a newcomer to British politics uh, in the sense that uh, she's in her 40s, but more importantly, she really has risen very quickly in the last few years post-Brexit. Even though she was in favor of Britain staying in the EU, uh, she very quickly joined the Brexiteers. Mm -hmm. She got a position in the Treasury, the Finance Ministry, and then she got the big jump. She got the big jump to become Foreign Secretary to raise her profile in Boris Johnson's government. And the big thing that Truss has done, and this is really style over substance, is has really modeled herself as Margaret Thatcher 2.0. Mm. That the whole idea of playing to the conservative right wing in terms of lowering taxes, uh, not worrying about redistributing uh, resources and income to help everyone, but very much going to this neoconservative approach as well as, of course, and this is in contrast to Margaret Thatcher, continuing to really deride the European Union and to go harder and harder on Brexit, even as that spells economic trouble for this country. And how is she, how is her popularity among the wider British population? Again, I mean, she was clearly preferred with these Conservative Party members who got to vote here, but broadening this out, how, what is the British population's opinion of her? Do they think she's capable of uniting the country? Well, first of all, Savannah, there's trouble within the party. Mm. She only received 57 percent of the vote amongst conservative members. Boris Johnson received 66 percent, David Cameron 67 percent in similar positions. And the baseline here was she needed to get at least 60 percent. So the party is split. But amongst the country at large, well, let me put this to you. When polled most recently amongst the British public, not just conservative members, 12 percent one, two, 12 percent of Britons thought she would be a good or excellent prime minister. More than half thought she would be a bad or terrible wow. prime minister. Wow. Those are some pretty stark numbers there. I also want to now bring in NBC News senior international correspondent Keir Simmons. And Keir, that's a great place to pick it up there, a question that kind of was just set up there, only 12 percent. I mean, let's talk about the challenges. There's one right there. It doesn't seem like she is necessarily that popular with the wider voting population. But then let's also talk some specific challenges, cost of living crisis. Also in Britain, these spiraling energy yeah. bills, that's a crisis. Does she have a plan to tackle some of these issues? Yeah, you know, Savannah, she's being compared uh, to Margaret Thatcher, and certainly the comparison fits if you want to think about the kinds of challenges, if people know their history, that Margaret Thatcher faced when she came into power here uh, in uh, the UK. Just behind me, just to tell you what is behind me, this is a conference centre where the vote was announced. You can see her folks, some folks 
who saw it still uh, spilling out. And over to my right, you can maybe hear a small handful of protesters unhappy that this was a vote of such a small group of Conservative Party members. Think of it as a little bit like a primary there in the States, except a primary where the general election is already decided. Tomorrow, uh, Liz Truss will take over from Boris Johnson, going to see the Queen at Balmoral in Scotland, uh, where, uh, she will, where she will take the take the mantle, uh, if you like. That is unprecedented, unprecedented in the reign of Queen Elizabeth. She would normally come here to Buckingham Palace because of her health concerns. She's staying there. Just another sense of the kind of uncertain atmosphere uh, here in the UK. You mention it. There are questions of inflation. They're talking about perhaps even 20 percent inflation uh, here. There is the war uh, in Ukraine. This trust has been clear that she will support uh, what Boris Johnson was doing uh, in Ukraine. And, and in fact, when she saw uh, Sergei Lavrov earlier this year, he described it, described talking to her, uh, Savannah, uh, as like talking to a deaf person. And then, as you mentioned, just to finish up, as you were mentioning, there is this huge energy crisis. They are saying that pubs up and down the country may have to close this winter because they will not be able to afford to wow. heat their pubs. Billions of pounds are likely to have to be spent, billions of dollars. Uh, this trust faces a, a mountain to climb. And you're right, that vote was not a resounding victory for her. Yeah. Keir Simmons and Scott Lucas, thank you both so much for your help on this breaking news this morning. Big news out of the UK. Thanks yeah. again. Now in Ukraine, UN inspectors say the situation is, quote, grave at Europe's largest nuclear power plant. The Russian-controlled Zaporizhia facility has been seen fighting nearby in recent weeks, with the only remaining external power line damaged by shelling. NBC News senior national correspondent Jay Gray has more. The sounds of children playing replaces the violent echo of bombs and bullets. But in this park, about 30 miles from the front lines, it's impossible to escape the constant fear that comes with war. It has not left us since the first days of the war. The heart is pounding, beating, thoughts are loaded, and everything is filled with fear. Zaporizhia is a city unlike any other in Ukraine. Here they face a dual threat, advancing Russian troops, their missiles, and the possibility of a nuclear disaster. Just outside the city, the scars of battle are evident at Europe's largest nuclear power plant. Uh, impact holes, um, markings on, on buildings of um, uh, shelling. So it means that the physical integrity of the facility uh, has been violated not once, but several, uh, several times. Shelling has knocked out the main power line to the plant, leaving just one of the six massive reactors operational with the facility under the control of Russian soldiers, but still being run by Ukrainian scientists. Independent inspectors remain on site, providing at least a bit of comfort for those coping outside the facility. I hope that they can change something, they can improve the situation, because we really need some control there. And I hope that they can help us. Because if there is no control, no people there who can look on this old stuff, I think that it will be just something awful. As families hold each other a little tighter now, many, like this grandmother, also clinging to the hope children will, she says, grow up in a free country that they will love Ukraine. Yeah, and look, four of the six independent inspectors that were inside that plant left this morning. The two that remain will be there indefinitely. Savannah, they'll be there to monitor the plan and do risk assessment on a regular basis. All right, Jay, thank you so much, and stay safe, of course. Coming up, a deadly stabbing spree and an ongoing manhunt in Canada this morning. The latest on the investigation coming up. News is happening now. A look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. 
NBC News, streaming free now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? Found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? No stress, no mess, just yum. That's it. Dateline Missing in America. Listen to the full season now. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? Found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers right now on Morning News Now. We're staying on top of the breaking situation in Ukraine. We are watching dangerous heat this week. Recession, I mean, is that where we're headed? Is there any way to avoid that? Morning News Now, streaming weekdays at 7. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, missing in America. Listen to the full season now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. Welcome back. Former President Trump was back in front of his supporters over the weekend for the first time since the search of his Florida home last month. And he had a lot to say about the FBI and about President Biden. NBC News White House correspondent Monica Alba has more. Former President Trump firing back at the Justice Department in his first rally since the lawfully executed FBI search of his private club last month. The shameful raid and break-in of my home, Mar-a-Lago, was a travesty of justice. Revealing that the hunt for classified documents extended not only to his wife's personal items, but also his teenage son's bedroom. Leaving everything they touched in far different condition than it was when they started. Legal experts say that's well within the bounds of the government search warrant. It's very common for a search warrant to allow searching of an area that may be occupied by different people in the household. After all, if everyone in the household has equal access to the space, then that's probably fair game. The DOJ says the FBI retrieved hundreds of pages of highly sensitive material from the Florida estate. And on Saturday, the former president also repeatedly taking aim at his successor. The most vicious, hateful, and divisive speech ever delivered by an American president. The 45th president blasting the 46th for that primetime address today, last week in which President today, Biden before... cast some Trump Republicans as a threat to the country. MAGA forces are determined to take this country backwards. He's an enemy of the state. You want to know the truth. But with the midterms now two months away, the White House says President Biden has no plans to stop criticizing the former president and his supporters. He has taken many, plenty of times uh, to call out where we are with the extreme, that extreme part of the Republican Party, and he will continue to do that. President Biden will be back in battleground Pennsylvania for the third time in the last week, spending part of Labor Day in Pittsburgh, where he'll speak to union workers and stump for Democratic candidates for Senate and governor in those key races ahead of the midterm elections. Back to you. All right, Monica, thank you so much. Now let's get you some international headlines. Canadian authorities are on the hunt for two suspects in yesterday's mass stabbing that left 10 dead and many injured. Ali Aruzi joins us now from Tehran with that and other international news this morning. Hey, Ali. 
Hey, good morning, Savannah. Well, a massive manhunt is underway in Canada as police search for two men suspected of stabbing at least 10 people to death in one of the deadliest acts of mass violence Canada has seen. The rampage has sent shockwaves through the nation. Uh, victims were found in 13 locations in the remote indigenous community James Smith Cree Nation and nearby Weldon. As news of the stabbings broke, a dangerous person's alert was sent to all mobile phones across the provinces of Saskatchewan, Manitoba and Alberta, an enormous region almost half the size of Europe. At least 15 others were injured in the killing spree, with police urging residents to be extremely vigilant as they conduct a search across one of Canada's largest and mo most remote regions. Police have not speculated what the motive behind the attacks may be. Pope John Paul I, who led the Roman Catholic Church for just 33 days, has been beatified by the Vatican, the penultimate step before sainthood. Described as the smiling pope, uh, John Paul I was the shortest serving pope since 1605. He died in 1978 of a heart attack sparking controversy and conspiracy theories. For an individual to be beatified, a miracle needs to be attributed to their prayers made to them after their death. The the miracle attributed to the now beatified Pope was the healing of an 11-year-old girl after her parents had prayed to Pope John Paul I. In the last thousand years, just eight popes have been made saints. And finally, a swimming cap made specifically for natural black hair has received official approval from the worldwide governing body for competitive swimming after initially being rejected for use at the Olympics last year, causing controversy about including exclusivity within competitive swimming. The sole cap, as it's known, is a covering made especially to protect hair, the thick, curly, braided, or otherwise textured, which is often difficult to fit into smaller swimming caps. And those are your international headlines, Savannah. Awesome. That's great to see you use the word, but inclusivity is so important. Ali, thank you so much. And now, from tech companies to luxury brands sanctioned imposed on Russia over the Ukraine war have forced many Western companies to pull out of the country. But now, Russian influencers and artists are speaking out against the boycott. NBC News foreign correspondent Megan Fitzgerald has the story. Russian influencers are fighting back, cutting ties with companies boycotting their country. I have to say, Chanel House does not respect their clients. Why do we have to respect Chanel House? In March, several companies, including the luxury fashion brand Chanel, closed their stores in Russia after the military invaded Ukraine. Katya Guseva, a popular Russian DJ, is speaking out. What's happening politically should not affect ordinary people. We as artists shouldn't have to feel ashamed, she said. NBC News reached out to Chanel multiple times for comment, but they've not responded. But in a statement released to European TV network Euronews, the company said to comply with recent sanction laws, high-priced items can't be taken into Russia. Russia is also changing its policies since the war broke out, now blocking Facebook and Instagram's parent company, Meta, from operating in the country. Russia was home to 7.5 million Facebook users and 80 million Instagram users. Meta earned $117 billion in revenue from the country last year. This year, the company's profits were down in the first two quarters. They're attributing the decline in part to the war. They are significantly impacted because uh, the ad revenue stopped completely due to the ban and the introduced legislation and people who were using Instagram for monetization obviously lost all of their profits. Experts say some move to Russian platforms while others still post on foreign socials, bypassing digital restrictions with VPN encryption software. They're still careful about what they post if they disagree with the invasion. After the Kremlin made it illegal to describe the Ukraine conflict as a war, those who do face 15 years in prison. Some people prefer not to say anything rather than adopt any position. And some people prefer to ignore reality. But Guseva says she still uses Meta through a VPN, as well as Russian social media platforms, to stay connected to her community. People were flourishing in this way of transcultural contacts where they were interacting and exchanging ideas. But then, apart from this cultural and social level, we had economic factors. 
it, it matters because it gave unemployment and revenues to so many people in Russia who right now literally left with nothing. Guseva said she sold some of her Chanel products and donated the money. We were heard. Our voices were heard, she said. Now she's hoping the world will one day hear her music again. Our thanks to Megan Fitzgerald for that report, and we will bring you the latest on the war in Ukraine within the next hour. And coming up, another scrubbed launch attempt for NASA's Artemis program over the weekend. We'll dig into what exactly went wrong and when we could finally hear the word liftoff. That's after the break. Hallie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. NBC News, streaming free now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the press now. Streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. here to start conversations because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand, so we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. It's the best time of the morning, time for the pop start, baby. I'm feeling the vibe today on the show. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. We're back with the latest on the Artemis mission to the moon. NASA is going back to the drawing board this morning, working on repairing a liquid hydrogen leak in the rocket's engine. The issue forced NASA to scrub the second attempt at the test flight Saturday after the leak was detected during the fueling process. NASA has announced it will not attempt another liftoff during this current launch period, which ends tomorrow. For more on the Artemis mission and this latest attempt, Paul Setter, professor at the Institute for Advanced Computational Science at Stony Brook University and the Flatiron Institute in New York City, joins us now. Paul, good morning. Always great to have you with us. So we are all just wanting to hear that liftoff and see the clapping in mission control. I mean, let's talk through this. It was a halted because of this bad engine sensor leaking fuel. That was the Monday attempt. And then Saturday's attempt was due to this hazardous leak that was detected during the fueling process. How big of a setback are these failures? What do you think when you hear these things are going wrong? I mean, when I when I hear these things, of course, I get bummed. I want to see a liftoff just <laughs> as much as everybody. But space is a game of patience. These are mm. incredibly technical devices. These are some of the most complex machines ever invented by humanity. They have millions of moving parts. And it is a controlled explosion. You have liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen combusting at over 5,500 degrees Fahrenheit. You don't want that to go wrong. And keep in mind, we have exactly one Artemis mm. rocket. We have mm -hmm. one. And man, I don't want it to blow up. Nobody remembers these delays, but nobody forgets a mm. disaster. So just be patient. It'll get up there. Uh, is a very, very, very good point. Um, and I love hearing you have this confidence that it will. So when, how soon do you think we could see another attempt? 
Well, like you mentioned, unfortunately, this is the end of the safety period for how long this particular rocket can stay on the launch pad. Plus, there are other launches scheduled for the same pad, so we got to get it out of the way. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to roll it back to the vertical assembly building to diagnose the issue. So we're looking at late September at the earliest, maybe mid-October. It really all depends on how quickly NASA engineers can fix this leak. So a reminder just for our viewers what this sort of is here. This is this test flight. Astronauts weren't going to be on it. There's going to be these dummies that are kind of seeing how a human could potentially react. And it's just the first of at least four planned Artemis missions. Will this launch continuing to be delayed push back future missions of the program? Does this have any greater impact on the on the bigger goal of this project? Actually, no. These delays of a few days, weeks, or even months, uh, this is business as usual. Rockets get delayed all the time. In the grand vision for Artemis to return humans to the surface of the moon, set up a sustainable presence on the moon, push forward to Mars, this is a, a decades-long process. So, so what's a few weeks between friends? Yeah. Remind us also, we just had a full screen up there, a graphic on the screen for viewers to see, but remind us of the greater mission here of Artemis. What are we trying to do? This first Artemis mission is, like you mentioned, a test flight, totally uncrewed, to test the rocket, to test the Orion spacecraft, to send it into the, uh, an orbit around the moon and return it safely to the Earth. The next mission, scheduled for a couple of years from now, will carry a crew on board to do the exact same thing. And then future Artemis missions will send that crew to the surface of the moon. And the goal here is not just to come back to the moon, but to set up a permanent presence on the moon. So cool. Paul Sutter, we love to talk about this with you. Thanks so much for joining us, and I'm sure we'll see you again on the next attempt. Thank you. All right, and coming up, a new heads-up approach to a different kind of defense from the NFL. As the 2022 season gets ready to kick off, we'll tell you about the latest piece of equipment that the league hopes will make practice a little safer. That's next. At 73, Prince Charles is still waiting for the job that is his birthright. Do we want Charles? Do we want a monarchy? I'm Keir Simmons, and we'll take on these questions and more in our new podcast, Born to Rule. Listen now. Still to come on the Channel 2 News. Well, the waters are certainly receding now. Still too close to call. Lester Holt reporting from the ground zero as it's uh, being referred to. It is, in fact, the taste of freedom. The Haitian people know a little something about resiliency. What's the biggest risk right now? Some of the troops who have been proud. I want to welcome you to the first presidential debate. In fact, we've been told we can't go any farther. You are some resilient folks. Let me get you in. Welcome back to today. We got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody, and that's it. Hallie Jackson now, weekdays at five on NBC News Now. It's the best time of the morning. Time for the pop star, baby. I'm feeling the vibe today on the show. At 73, Prince Charles is still waiting for the job that is his birthright. Do we want Charles? Do we want a monarchy? I'm Keir Simmons, and we'll take on these questions and more in our new podcast, Born to Rule. Listen now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Here's what's happening in your neck of the woods. At 73, Prince Charles is still waiting for the job that is his birthright. Do we want Charles? Do we want a monarchy? I'm Keir Simmons, and we'll take on these questions and more in our new podcast, Born to Rule. Listen now. NBC News, streaming free now. 
Still to come in the Channel 2 News. Well, the waters are certainly receding now. Still too close to call. Lester Holt reporting from me. Round zero, as it's uh, being referred to. It is, in fact, a taste of freedom. The Haitian people know a little something about resiliency. What's the biggest risk right now? Some of the troops who have been proud. I want to welcome you to the first presidential debate. In fact, we've been told we can't go any farther. Here are some resilient folks. Let me get a hint. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Welcome back. And turning now to Tennessee, where an urgent search is underway for a missing mother of two. Police say the victim was abducted, forced into an SUV early Friday while out for a jog. The alleged suspect now in custody as investigators push for answers. NBC News correspondent Jesse Kirst joins us now from Memphis with the very latest. Hey, Jesse, good morning. Savannah, good morning. Police say Eliza Fletcher was last seen early Friday just behind me here along the University of Memphis campus. Authorities say that's when an SUV drove past her, then stopped waiting for Fletcher to jog by. Investigators believe that's when someone got out of the SUV and kidnapped her. From the skies and on foot, police scouring this Memphis neighborhood Sunday, searching for a mother now missing for more than three days. And this morning, even after arresting Eliza Fletcher's alleged captor, police say the suspect still won't tell them where to find the missing mother of two. More than anything, we want to see Liza returned home safely. As investigators combed the city for any trace of the junior kindergarten teacher, the 34-year-old's family sharing this video over the weekend, her husband visibly emotional. Liza has touched the hearts of many people, and it shows. Fletcher is the granddaughter of a prominent local hardware store magnate, and the family is well known in the area. According to court documents, she was on her morning jog early Friday when 38-year-old Cleotha Abstin got out of this SUV near the University of Memphis campus, ran aggressively toward Fletcher, and forced her into the vehicle, driving away. Hours later, the afternoon. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.